We are starting today after our summer break with the wonderful, amazing and extremely radical text called the Tripura Rahasya. This is a tantric text and it is a very unique text. We are using the common we are using the uh, text, the translation by Swami Rama and Pandit Rajmani. The very first translation from the Sanskrit of the Tripura Rasya into English was undertaken by Ramanashram from South India. Many of you know it as the ashram or the place of Raman Maharishi. And since this text was highly recommended by him, and he recommended it to many of his students, there being no English translation available. Raman Maharishi commissioned the very first English translation himself, oversaw it, and this particular translation is the second one, and it's slightly different. The very first translation is a little bit academic, the language is slightly different because it is older, and this translation is not really academic. It has the background of a meditative tradition and it is using simpler English, easier to follow. What is really important about this translation is that while in the credits they talk about the translation by Pandit Rajamani, Swami Rama had a very big part to play in this translation and when we read the introduction we will understand some of this better. This introduction by Swami Rama I'm going to read and in between I will stop um, make comments and of course if there are any questions we will uh, Hear the questions and I'll try to answer them. I hope everyone can hear me clearly. Good, since nobody's written uh, otherwise, <laughs> I'm assuming that everyone can hear me clearly. Yes, I can hear. Okay, good. <laughs> Absolutely, says Barry. Great. All human beings experience their waking, dreaming and sleeping states. But only a fortunate few, the yogis, attain the fourth state called Turiya. These rare ones reach the summit and have a profound view of all states experienced by human beings. The aspirant who has attained such a lofty state is rare and knows the mystery of life here and hereafter. Nothing remains unknown to him. Such a great yogi does not belong to any caste, creed, sex or ethnic group because he has already transcended all such superficial limitations. The knowledge that enlightens such an aspirant is called Tripura Rahasya. I will comment briefly on this. Not all of us are familiar with the concepts the ideas here. Waking, dreaming, sleeping states are the three states of consciousness and the one who witnesses these three states of consciousness, the witness, is who we really are. It is the answer to the question, who am I? And when one is established in this witness state, you understand it is in fact not really a state and therefore in yoga it was called merely called the fourth 
due, the, due to the limitations of languages, we end up calling it the fourth state. In reality, it is called Turiya, that means the fourth. And one who is established in the fourth, in the state of witness, is like a person who is on top of a summit. He has a 360 degrees view, he sees all around. If you are still climbing up the mountain, you cannot see what is behind the mountain. You can see a little bit below, but you don't have an overview. It's when you are right on top of the summit, you can see all around and you have a complete overview. Similarly, in this state, the fourth, you have a complete view or overview like you would be on a summit. And such a person knows all the mysteries of life. There are no more questions left to be answered. And such a person is neither Christian, nor Hindu, nor Muslim, nor Buddhist, is nor male, nor female, because all identifications have dissolved. These identities are false identities. This is not who you are. You are that one who witnesses. You are beyond these three states. And this knowledge is explained in the Tripura Rahasya. Rahasya means mystery or secret. And Tripura is the three cities. Three is three and Tripura Pura is Pur is like a city. And the three cities are the waking, dreaming and sleeping states. It's like dwelling in three cities. So this is the secret or the mystery of the three cities. The text by that name is one of the most significant scriptures in the tradition of Tantra Yoga. Its beauty lies in the fact that it expounds the lofty knowledge of inner truth while systematically offering practical instructions on Shakti Sadhana. In Shakti Sadhana, the aspirant learns to apply all of his resources to the task of awakening the dormant fire within, leading it to higher awareness, finally reaching the highest chakra, the lotus, the thousand petaled lotus. In advanced stages of practice, the aspirant knows all about his future, even in even the next life. This is the glory of Shakti Sadhana. So here he talks about Shakti Sadhana. Shakti or the Shakta tradition is the more that part of Tantra that is related to feminine energy. Now this is very often misunderstood as the left-handed path being a path of decadence, debauchery and orgies. It is often misunderstood, maligned as tantrics who indulge in black magic or who indulge in the five M's. These are indulging in meat, wine, sexual activities and um, this is actually quite far from the truth. The left-handed path or the path related to the feminine energy is that aspect of all of us that is unconscious. This relates to the secrets of the unconscious mind the hidden, when we practice or have shakti sadhana, it means we are learning about our unknown part, the hidden part, which is the unconscious mind. This sadhana is not necessarily for everyone. 
It requires guidance. The right hand path relates to the conscious mind. It relates to learning to manage our life, using techniques, so that we are able to structure our lives better, lead a happier, healthier life. While this is very useful, this may not give you direct insight into your deeper aspects and may not help you to get to know yourself, the witness. Therefore, when it says, it's referring to Shakti Sadhana here, practical instructions, it's not necessarily referring to techniques or practices, but it's referring to that aspect of us that is unconscious and it brings that aspect forward. Any questions or comments so far? For those of you who are here for the first time, you may use the chat to ask questions or to participate in a discussion. You may also unmute yourself and ask questions if you like, provided that you do not have any background noise or we don't have any technical issues, such as an echo. Coming back to the text. The tradition. So in this section we will try to understand where the Tripura Rahasya is coming from and what this knowledge is about. Traditionally, spiritual knowledge was handed down from gurus to their disciples. This tradition still exists. In ancient India, it was customary for a student to know about the tradition and lineage of the knowledge he was receiving before he started treading the path of light. Thus, the Tripura Rahasya opens with the references to the tradition through which it has been transmitted. The seers Medha and Sumedha are said to be spokesmen of this scripture. They made it available to the oral tradition and from there it was committed to writing. They received this knowledge from the sage Parashurama. Parashurama received it from Dattatreya, Dattatreya from Brahma, Brahma from Vishnu, and Vishnu from Shiva. In the Markandeya Pur Purana, it is said that Medha Rishi was also a teacher of the Sapta Sati, another prominent scripture of Shakti Sadhana. Medha Rishi was initiated by the great sage Parshurama and so in reciting the scripture Medha Rishi begins with the story of Parshurama. So to say a little bit about the origins of the scripture as most of you know that the knowledge of self-realization, yogic knowledge, tantric knowledge was for thousands of years kept secret and the fact is it is still kept secret. It is not given out very easily. There are many techniques that are available, available in the internet, available in all sorts of organizations, available in books, but these techniques are not very useful if they are not accompanied by proper guidance into how they should be practiced, if you do not understand the complete system, don't have an overview, and you do not get continual guidance over a longer period of time, because there are many pitfalls on this path, especially the path, the left-hand path or the tantric path, which is helping to reveal or shed light on the unconscious mind. So these traditions, they exist even today. 
and those who are part of such a tradition should know where the tradition comes from it's like you are a part of a family and you know your parents your grandparents you know unconsciously passively a lot about your own family history here in a lineage it is important to consciously understand your roots so the seers medha and sumedha the spokesmen of this scripture sumedha also had another name harithiana he was sage harithiana and this scripture is he is the author of the scripture and um, in certain places he is referred to as sumedha and in some places he is referred to as sage harithiana it was traditionally the case that whenever there was a scripture written by any sage he did not claim that he wrote it he did not put his name on it and sign it like authors do today as many of you know i have a book i have written a book and it's called master in pranayama so when you see the cover you will see my name on it and that is traditional practice these days that's what people do if they write a book and they're authors they have their name on it that's not how it used to be spiritual books in particular were attributed to a higher power so to say no self respecting sage would put his name on the book and say i am the author they would always say this knowledge came from my teacher my teacher got it from his teacher and his teacher got it from brahma and brahma got it from vishnu and vishnu got it from shiva so all the knowledge was always attributed to shiva and shiva is not meant to be just a deity blue skin deity with cobras around his neck shiva means consciousness so all knowledge comes from that source within you atman shiva pure consciousness so when the sages wrote they wrote out of their own deeper intuitive experience and everything that came out they did not identify themselves with it it came out from a higher source and they were merely instruments or mediums now we continue reading and we refer to one of the main characters in this book which is parshurama stephanie and shibu your questions about kala mishra and samaya will be answered at a later stage we are going through the introduction right now and i would like to stick to that for the simple reason that this differentiation in the schools will take us away from from the main uh, topic at hand right now parshurama is one of the main characters or one, the main character i would say in this this text He is one of the key links in the long chain of the tradition of the Himalayan sages. At one time, Parshurama stopped doing his austerities. He felt badly about his lapse and repented. In this frame of mind, he encountered a man who was pretending to be completely disorganized and mentally disturbed. The man ignored him, but Parshurama, determined to talk to him, made persistent efforts to get his attention the man did not lose his temper even though parshurama teased him obstinately but kept on smiling mumbling something that parshurama did not understand this behavior convinced parshurama 
that he had encountered a great sage who had conquered lust and anger, and so he surrendered himself at the man's feet. Seeing this, the man said, I am Brihaspati's brother, Samvarth. I renounced my home in my childhood and began practicing contemplation. I protect myself from people by posing as a lunatic. I remain in contemplation all the time and have no time to teach you. Go to the sage Tattatreya and he will initiate you in the worship of Tripura. Now, <laughs> it's a funny story, but it's actually not uncommon that many yogis, sages, would act very strangely. They had very peculiar behavior because they did not want to be disturbed by laypersons or worldly people who, out of curiosity, would come and ask them all sorts of questions. We had this sort of encounter when I took the mentoring program on a, a retreat in the Himalayas. We went to uh, one of the most powerful spots in our tradition in the Garhwal Himalayas and there we spent a few days in meditation. It's a very, very quiet place and a very powerful place for meditation and there are also in those mountains some sannyasis who are living in caves. One of our members was very keen on going and asking questions to the sannyasi, which I strictly forbid because these people have not retired into caves so that everybody who passes by and is a little bit curious suddenly goes and disturbs them with what they would consider foolish questions. So what these people did to keep away such curious, curious people, disrespectful people, was to pose as lunatics. There were even yogis who would start throwing stones at people who would come in their direction to keep them away. Once they had a reputation, then everybody kept away in any case. So Samvarth, this great sage, says, I don't have time to teach you. In reality, it was he didn't want to spend time teaching him and he sent him to Dattatreya. Now, Dattatreya is the next important character in this text. So there are two. There's the student or the seeker, Parshurama, and there is the teacher, Dattatreya. Dattatreya is considered to be teacher of teachers. He is the teacher of this kalpa, and uh, that means of, of these ages. So he is considered to be a very, very great teacher. Our tradition is of this lineage. We teachers and students of this lineage trace ourselves back to Dattatreya. I'll continue reading the introduction by Swami Rama. Hearing this, Parshurama went to Gandhamadana cave, sorry, mountain, where the revered Dattatreya lived. This mountain is north of the Himalayas. In this calm and tranquil setting, he found someone seated in a meditative pose who greeted him with a smile, saying, You are in the right place. The sage Dattatreya is seated in the inner chamber of this ashram. You may go in. Parshurama entered and saw the sage. A courtesan was seated next to him, trying her best to charm him, and a goblet of wine was by his side. Parshurama was completely bewildered by this, that he had faith in Samvarta. Reminding himself that sages have their peculiar ways, he prostrated and sat in front of Dattatreya. The sage welcomed him. O Parshurama, you have taken the path of enlightenment. To attain perfect control over sense gratifications is the way of victory. To have control over the palate and the sexual urge is a great achievement. As you see, 
I keep the objects of enjoyment with me. Both wine and courtesan are by my side. Seeing this, all the sages have left me. They despise me now. What have you come? For what have you come? Do you not hate me? Parshurama replied, I have heard about you from the sage Samvartha and I have come to your feet with great shraddha, faith. Please instruct me. So we see here that he has been tested. And he came in there into this ashram. He sees a courtesan, he sees wine. These things which are all considered to be taboo or unacceptable by seekers must have obviously shocked him. But he had faith in Samvarta. He had faith and therefore he still went to him and asked him to teach him. Very often students have preconceived notions about their teachers. They create a picture imagination of how their teachers are supposed to be. And one of the classical pictures is a elderly man with flowing white beard, flowing white or saffron robes. This is one of the favorite pictures, very common. And with respect to behavior, personality, the classical approaches, my teacher should be always smiling, should never get angry, should always be nice to me. And so what you do is you create such a picture of the teacher that the teacher is not free. If he is supposed to live up to your image, that he's not free and he's not a teacher. So teachers will test you. Are you interested in the superficial aspect? What clothes do I wear? Is it the clothes that make the teacher? Or do you want to look for something deeper? So there are many ways that teachers of a tradition test their students. Sometimes people, modern students, think, oh, am I going to be tested? Do I have to jump off a cliff? No, nothing as uh, dramatic as that. Sometimes it's the simple things that tell the teacher the most about the student. Any questions rela related to this so far? Or anything that anybody would like to share, say? For those who joined in late, we are going through the introduction to the Tripura Rahasya by Swami Rama to give us a general idea about the book. We need to understand the tradition and the background before we actually start. It's a very radical book, very different from most uh, spiritual texts. And for those of you who enjoy this, uh, I would say that it's very unique because... In this text, the three main teachers are all female. The first is a princess who teaches her husband the prince. The second is a female renunciate. The third is goddess Tripura uh, Sundari herself. I'll continue to read the text. Sage Dattatreya was happy to comply and imparted the knowledge of Tripura Rahasya in the traditional manner. Having received this knowledge, Parshurama departed for Mahindra mountain to do his sadhana. This phase of his sadhana lasted 12 years and according to the tradition, it was during this time that he initiated Sumedha Rishi. The text of the scripture translated in this volume begins at the end of this 12-year period. So Sumedha Rishi or the sage Haritiana became the student of Parshurama at the end of the 12-year period and therefore he was writing down a lot of the teachings what Parshurama then dictated to him or explained to him. 
So, about initiation, Swami Rama says, Shakti sadhana is not possible without initiation. Just as the Vedas cannot be studied without Upanayana Samskara, initiation into the sacred thread, Shakti sadhana cannot be done without formal initiation by the teacher. In Shakti sadhana, the yogi awakens the Shakti power of his disciple through Tiksha. There are various levels of initiation and it is given according to the aspirant state of mind and level of awareness. It is important for seekers to thoroughly study the Tripura Rahasya under the, under the guidance of a competent master who has attained the knowledge of this scripture. To become qualified for the guidance of such a master, the student must have developed three qualities. First, he should be endowed with firm faith. Second, he should be free from attachment of mind and thine. And third, he should have a burning desire to attain pure knowledge. It has become common practice, if um, I may comment on this now, on this section on initiation, that many students want to be initiated. They go around collecting mantras. They go and are initiated by different teachers. But that is only preliminary aspect. The real initiation is when one is prepared for this diksha and it is like a farmer who prepares the field before he sows the seeds. Imagine the farmer would not prepare the field and he would only scatter the seeds. What would happen? Most of these seeds would be flying away in the wind. Many would not. The roots would grow but would not be able to hold on to the ground and so they would die. And very few of these seeds would actually germinate and grow into plants. So we see there the importance of preparing the field. So Shakti Sadhana is not merely collecting mantras, getting diksha, paying money and getting diksha, but having a tradition and a teacher who guides you, prepares you, so that when the mantra falls, on the field, these are mantras are like seeds, then it germinates, it takes hold and it transforms you. And this is that power then that is transforming you. So studying the Tripura Rahasya when accompanied by guidance of a teacher, you have a completely different approach or understanding of what you are reading. Otherwise, people read books and they understand things out of their own limited perspective. And Mostly, these are misinterpretations. So, we say in our tradition, what do you need a teacher for? The teacher is there to give you the correct interpretation of the scriptures. These scriptures are all available in the internet. They are all available in book form or websites. So, why do you need a teacher? You need a teacher to give you the correct interpretation. Any questions about this, about initiation? What the initiation, um, Shibu, your question is it Bija Mantra or Sri Vidya Mantra? As it already says there, the initiation depends on the level of the student, the level of the student's state of mind and level of awareness. The text 
I am continuing to read. The Tripura Rahasya explains all the stages of enlightenment and inspires the student at every step. Other scriptures only talk about certain principles and tell the script seeker what to do and what not to do, but they do not explain how to be. This scripture furnishes both the principles and practices. Another unique aspect of this scripture is that it is ascribed to a female deity. In the Tripura Rasya, through the worship and devotion to the Divine Mother, the aspirant fathoms all levels systematically and finally attains the highest state of consciousness. Most other scriptures use the word he or other pronouns in the masculine or neuter gender by referring to God, but the Tripura Rasya uses the word mother and other feminine gender terms when referring to the highest deity. A child finds comfort in his mother's lap and is very close to her. It is easy for a child to converse with its mother and to learn from her. Similarly, in sadhana, the seeker finds his practices easy and spontaneous when he uses the word mother, shakti, mahamaya or tripura, sundari. It's not just about using the word, it's about the image. When you think about mother or when you think about father, what kind of images come to mind? For most of us who have been raised in a more classical manner, the father is a more authoritative figure and the mother is more loving, gentle, kind, nurturing. And naturally, all children have a deeper love for their mother especially in the earlier years, and learn very easily with that loving guidance. And so this form of worship, where you see God in the more feminine form, is considered to be easier. Back to the text. This highly practical scripture also reminds an aspirant that without Sankarp Shakti, which means firm determination, neither philosophical knowledge nor spiritual practice has great value. It is through Sankarp Shakti that one gathers the courage to tread the path. Bhakti or devotion is also needed. For without it, spiritual practice becomes dry and technical. In order to acquire the virtues of Sankarp Shakti and Bhakti, an aspirant must cultivate positive thinking, virtue of purified and sharpened intellect. When the faculty of the discrimination is sharpened, Sankarp Shakti strengthens. Sankarp Shakti is a prerequisite for entering the subtle realms within. Without it, one cannot tread the path of bhakti. Bhakti means compassion plus devotion. When the seeker equips himself with these two exquisite qualities, he is fully prepared to tread the path. Firm faith develops in the company of sages by contemplating on Atman and by practicing the systematic method of meditation. Before we go into that, I would like to comment on bhakti. Very often, bhakti or devotion is considered to be an emotional thing, something about singing songs, dancing. It's associated with these aspects. So... It's not merely something emotional and it's not just about singing and dancing. It is actually a deep longing that surfaces within you for the highest good, for the highest knowledge, for, for liberation. 
when this bhakti comes, it is actually the beginning. It's not the end. It is also the end, but it is first the beginning. And that's what leads us to motivates us to practice, to take up discipline and to get to know ourselves. And when we go through that process of purification, we find that beautiful treasure within and then that bhakti flows forward, that's bhava or mahabhava. So bhakti is not something external. In the deepest meaning is that bhakti is something deeper within us, which overflows. Question from Sajan. By worshipping Sri Yantra, are we praying for Divine Mother? Sri Yantra is a geometrical picture, diagram, for those of you who don't know, which is has deeper meaning, represents a form of the universe in a geometrical way, a manner. To answer that question, most people pray to this geometrical form without any understanding of what is behind it. The geometrical representation of the Sri Yantya is actually yourself. So in the Samaya tradition, which is our tradition, you do not use external means, but you go to the Sri Yant actual Sri Yantya, that is the body itself. And the deity within is the Divine Mother, or everything is the Divine Mother. So external practices, are in fact, to answer now the question from Shibu and Stefani, are Kavala practices. Samaya school is purely internal and Mishra is that which is mixed. It's got a little external and a little bit internal. The word Mishra means mixed. How do we begin on this path? We need Sankalp Shakti or determination and we need to sharpen our buddhis, our intellect. And without these two qualities, one cannot tread this path. So you need to have these two. And what are the simple, simple practices? Coming back to the text. First, Learn to sit still, keeping the head, neck and trunk in a straight line, yet remain relaxed. Second, practice withdrawing the senses from the objects of the world by fixing the attention on the flow of the breath. Make the mind aware that the breath and the mind are like two sides of the same coin. They are inseparable twin laws of life. It has been proven scientifically that when the mind is agitated, the inhalation and exhalation also become agitated and jerks, shallowness and several other inconsistencies appear in the flow of the breath. So these are the two basic steps here. First is learning to sit straight, head, neck, trunk aligned. And second is learning to keep the mind focused on the breath. So these two steps have been dealt in detail in my book, Mastering Pranayam. The next, sorry. The next step is to realize the nearness of the self within. This is accomplished by gearing the mind and its modifications one-pointedly to the individual self. Upasana means to be near, means to be constantly aware of the self within. 
This is the prime goal of sadhana which leads the seeker to the highest state of attainment. So referring, coming back to the schools of Tantra, we said that Kaula was an external school and the biggest step, we say, the biggest step of progress in a seeker is when he begins to understand that what he is looking for is not to be found outside and he turns his attention inwards. And that is a very important step. We are not looking for deities outside or God in heaven in different forms and having elephant heads and blue skins or different idols and deities. But you realize this pure consciousness within you is the divine. So, as Swami Rama says here in this line, the prime goal of sadhana is that which leads the seeker to the highest. So, upasana has two aspects, external and internal. In external worship, objects such as flowers and fruits are used, rituals such as fire ceremony. Internal worship, the mind and its modifications are made one-pointed and inward. Thus, as the Yoga Sutras say, the seeker is established in his own nature. So, we see how these texts are all, in fact, saying the same thing. Whether it's the Bhagavad Gita, the Yoga Sutra, the Tripura Rahasya, they're all saying the same thing, but from different angles. There are scholars that get into arguments and discussions and someone will say, oh, the Bhagavad Gita is meant for householders. The Yoga Sutras is a technical text and it's uh, intellectual and... Uh, Tripura Rahasya is an esoteric thing, it's a left-handed path and uh, it's not for beginners. In reality, all these texts are saying the same thing. It's because we do not understand this that we <clears throat> try to put them into some sort of box, give it a label. Okay. Any questions? Comments about the text on this subject? Is there anybody? Puri has written to me directly. I would request those of you who are new not to write me private messages. It's not possible for me during a session to respond to private messages. Please write the messages in the chat for everybody and I will respond to it. Puri writes here, generally bhakti comes from parents. I am not sure what exactly you mean by that. I assume you're referring to the upbringing that parents teach you certain things and maybe rituals or, or um, certain devotion to certain deities. And that is exactly what we are not talking about. We are referring here in this text mainly to bhakti, mainly to bhakti as in an internal overflowing of devotional, the devotional aspect. When the longing in you arises for the highest, for liberation. And that does not generally come from the parents, but comes from deeper within you. And the upbringing may have a play a certain influence on it, but I would say it's not only the parents. It's become partly when you say everything comes from the parents, what happens is you become weak. You become weak because all your problems you have, you will say, it's my parents' fault. And that will make you weak because you can change your life. You can decide what to do with your life and what actions you take in the future, now and in the future, so that you can change your life. You can be the architect of your own destiny. But if you keep blaming, for example, just an example, your parents for your problems, 
then you become weak. You will never get out of that. So the parents have an important role to play, but not the only uh, factor. So now we come to the three schools of Shakti Sadhana. And I'll continue reading. If there are no questions about the text. There are three main schools of Shakti Sadhana, Kala, Mishra and Samaya, which correspond to the mental state and preparedness of the aspirant. All are concerned with awakening the Kundalini energy from its dormant state at the base of the spine and leading it to the crown chakra. Kaula is a highly systematic method of spiritual discipline which uses objects such as yantras, mandalas as a means of spiritual unfoldment, incorporating them into complex rituals designed to bring the senses under control. Adherents of this school Concentrate on awakening the divine force latent in the Muladhara chakra, the root chakra, the very first chakra. Mishra means combination or combined or mixed. It is a midpoint between Kala and Samaya. It is here that the student begins the transition from external to internal worship. In this school, the student masters the symbolic meaning of the yantras and learns to internalize them with devotion. The master imparts the systematic method of leading the kundalini force to the anahat chakra, the heart center, which becomes the center of concentration. And samaya is the highest of the three schools and is practiced only by accomplished yogis. The word samaya means I am with you. When the aspirant attains this state, he feels as though he is walking in Brahman consciousness all the time. His ajapa japa becomes spontaneous and effortless. Even in deep sleep, he remains aware of his mantra because mantra becomes the predominant factor in all the activities of life. This school leads the aspirant directly to moksha, liberation. So we see now, I'll comment on these three schools here. The difference is basically the nature of the practice. As I mentioned earlier, Kala is external, Samaya is completely internal and Mishra is in between. Another aspect is that Kala, the focus remains on the first chakra. This does not necessarily mean that they are actually mentally focusing on the first chakra. What this means is that they are external oriented. Therefore, they use yantras and complex rituals. And that is the first chakra. The first chakra is the external world. One does not actually concentrate on the Muladhara chakra. Mishra is... In between, it's a transition. And so Anahat Chakra is in the center. Between the first and the seventh chakra, Anahat is in the middle. And here the forces are balanced. The upward and downward moving energies are balanced. And Samaya means I am with you. And here already the one who is practicing this is only having internal practices and he is constantly feeling that he is with God or God is with him, whether in the form of father or mother, doesn't matter. And this worship is spontaneous and effortless. And this is the most predominant factor in his life, in his activities. He's, he's a witness. Not necessarily a witness all the time, but that bhakti is there all the time. That devotion is there all the time. Any questions about these three schools?
She boosts question the rituals, improve concentration of seeker, or will they get any other blessing from rituals? Well, yes, it's meant to help the aspirant focus and depending on the form of the ritual and the state of the mind, very often seekers at this level, at this level of the external world who are practicing rituals are seeking material gains or have desires that need want to be fulfilled. For example, many of them practice rituals to get wealth, to get <laughs> married, to get children, to get a job, you know. So, and these external practices, whether these desires are fulfilled or not, there is no guarantee. Because rituals, there are no guarantee. In the Samaya uh, level, when you are at that level, you are working with the desires themselves. You have learned that the microcosm is the same as macrocosm. So, when you are at that level, you are able to create your own world. So, all your desires can be fulfilled. You will see Eventually, one of the stories in this text is about a sage and his son. And the son is creating worlds. He's creating his own world in a mountain. And what that is and the symbolism of that, I will explain to you, of course, when we come to that. But the external rituals are not reliable for getting your desires fulfilled. All of you have done it perhaps in some form or the other, whether Christians or uh, Buddhists or any religion, people go to the temple, to the church, to, to the house of worship. They, they want something. It happens, it doesn't happen. Sometimes it happens and you say, oh, if my God was very kind and gave it to me. If it doesn't happen, we just forget about it. We accept it. So that's... Uh, why we uh, say that the external practices can, can but may not necessarily always bring any other blessings, as you put it. Sachin has a question. Uh, why liberation cannot be achieved in Mishra? Well, it's... it's uh, it's, it's a transition. That's why. It's a transition. It's not the highest. Liberation is that which is the highest. And when you are at the highest, liberation is possible. But it's also possible then, if you're a real master, to still function in the external world. That's the complete path. Purnamarg. You're able to come back into the world and help the people out of compassion to release them also from these uh, bondage of karma. So we continue talking about Samaya school and Tripura has said this text is about the Samaya school. So this school leads the aspirant to moksha at this stage, the body is considered to be a living shrine in which the divine force dwells. All practices are internal. No internal method, such as contemplation or meditation, can be accomplished without establishing perfect harmony between the mind and the breath. The aspirant is given breathing practices to establish this harmony. And my book, Mastering Pranayama, is all about the Samaya practices. So for those of you who are interested, they are very different from the practices that most people are using, which are commonly used in yoga studios and generally um, by people in all over the world today. I will complete this section before we end this session. 
When the aspirant is fully prepared and still encounters obstacles, the master bestows his grace. Through his kind touch or gaze, the master gives the aspirant his power. This rare occurrence is called Shaktipat. It is not possible to bestow Shaktipat on masses as few modern teachers pretend to do so. In all three schools of Shakti Sadhana, awakening of Kundalini Shakti is the central theme. The initiation is given step by step. The highest initiation is called Mahaveda. In Mahaveda, the final knot of ignorance is cut asunder and the aspirant has access to the highest knowledge. So, to comment on this, a very sincere student practices, he goes through the Kaula period where he may be externally oriented in rituals and things, finds a teacher or his himself or herself gaining the insight that he needs to move inwards and drops slowly external practices, goes inward, he's now Mishra, slowly, gradually, strengthens his practices, his purification process, harmonizes the mind with coordination of the different aspects of Antakarna, that is Manas, Buddhi, Chitta and Ankara. And when the mind is now one-pointed, he is really on track with the Samaya path. Everything is internal. And still there is an obstacle. Still he has not got the highest grace. Such a dedicated, sincere student can receive grace from his teacher. It is also possible that grace comes in other forms. Like there is Guru Kripa, there is also higher grace which comes through internal practices but this cannot be given to the masses there are teachers who are giving people some mantras and they call it shakti part and they're giving it to everybody and everybody thinks something amazing is happening now to me but in reality this is not shakti part the actual meaning of shakti part is as follows shakti is that power Energy, pure consciousness, universal consciousness. And pata means that which falls. So it is grace, it comes from above. And you have to have really done your part. You don't, it doesn't come to you if, you if you're not going to do your practice. You know, if you don't do sadhana, if you're not really training. So all these three schools, the main aspect is that initiation is given also step by step. And the highest initiation is called Mahaveda, it's also called Sambhavi Diksha, now it's also called Shaktipat. So it's a different names for the same thing that is removing that last obstacle. Sachin's question. When the aspirant gets highest knowledge, can he not use the higher self for liberation himself without a guru? Well, he will not get the highest knowledge. Um, it's not necessary that guru parampara does not mean guru dependency. I think there is a fear among modern students. Say, can I not have this without a guru? Or can this not be possible to do it ourselves without a teacher? Because we are afraid that the teacher is going to tell us things that we don't like to hear. And sometimes we think we create this guru cult ideas. Is a, uh, some person with these hypnotic uh, eyes which are going to hypno you know, hypnotize you. A bit like you know the snake ka in the jungle book. He has these very round uh, hypnotic eyes. And so this fear that you're going to be somehow brainwashed or that you give up everything 
your identity and so there is this fear and it's it's unfounded i think if you find a good teacher who can help you progress we are so used to the idea of having teachers and everything else you know anything you study in the world you have a teacher but here students want to have progress without a teacher so um and yeah all the three schools are about kundalini but the kundalini is not necessarily awakened uh, in all three schools in the sense that when the kundalini awakens you will lose you will have lost interest in external practices so kaula is about wanting something higher but the direction has to change the direction is external so the direction has to turn internal and only when that happens is there uh, awakening so having discussions about awakening is different from actual awakening sambhavi diksha is given by shiva says uh, sumit yes it is said who is shiva shiva is not the blue god with cobras around his neck shiva is the self the higher self so that last obstacle can also be removed through grace as i said it doesn't have to be a external teacher it can be internal grace so that's why shakti path is something that falls it falls from above it's grace from a higher divine source okay thank you very much we stop our session here it's a good place to stop we continue next time and so see you all next saturday bye bye perry sulvi tran yes thank you everybody for being here pavan nita okay rakesh thank you really bye bye